don't think so, but you can certainly plug it in. Oh, there we go. There we go. Good. I should back up one slide. So I have an interesting way to, to sort of talk about microservices. I'm going to talk about everything but microservices to some degree uh, to introduce this. Because to some degree, microservices done by itself will probably fail. There's a lot of ancillary things you want to do to sort of make sure it works. And that's the subject of my talk today. Uh, this is just basically in the deck in case you get a copy. The key thing here is, is this. And I've basically spent my career being on the edge of technology. Um, so a lot of things I talk about are bleeding edge things. They may be things that are not appropriate for you and your organization yet, but my guess is within the next three to five years, you'll be doing a lot of things that uh, we're hearing about today. But don't feel bad if you're not doing so a lot of these things yet. Uh, it will happen. Uh, I go to a lot of conferences. Uh, I usually speak at around about a conference a month uh, for the last four or five years. Uh, and I see a lot of conference topics come up. I mean, microservices now has a dedicated track. There are a few dedicated conferences associated with microservices. But you're also seeing these other topics becoming uh, vogue in these classes. Certainly cloud's been there for a while. We have dedicated conferences associated with Docker at this point. Uh, a lot of other technologies there. But you're also seeing a lot of focus on, on process stuff. You know, we've been, been doing Agile now for almost, over 15 years. But now they're becoming some more sort of advanced Agile, more aggressive Agile things coming out. Uh, I talk about one called Programmer Anarchy, which is my experiences here at London working for a company called Forward. But there's also uh, Eric Myers talking about this stuff. He calls it One Hacker Away, a more aggressive style of Agile. But you're also seeing things that the uh, business side is also trying to adopt very similar sort of Agile concepts. Things like uh, you know, Lean Startup Movement, the whole concept of minimum viable product. And you're also you're seeing now a focus on particular roles. You know, there's entire conferences associated with DevOps. And there's a new focus on full stack developers as being something you may want to, want to do versus the specialists we tend to have. There's a common theme I've seen through all these things. All these things are designed to allow your organization to go faster. From the time I have an idea till I have that idea deployed, we're trying to make sure we do that faster. And these all are topics associated with that speed. So I want to talk about what it takes to go faster. To some degree, we're solving a different class of problems now than we solved, say, 20 years ago when I was writing code then. And it's, it's best explained using the Kinefin model from a guy named Dave Snowden. He's Welch. Um, we won't hold that against him, I'm sure. But he talks about breaking problems up into various classifications. He says simple problems, the cause and effect relationship is very straightforward. This might be an organization where you have a call center and it's very easy to talk about what a call center should do. He also says they're complicated problems. There is a cause and effect relationship, but it's somewhat convoluted. It's the domain of the expert to help you to figure that out. But he doesn't stop there. He also says there are other problems that he calls complex and chaotic. A complex problem is one where the cause and effect relationship does not exist. Yes, if something happens, you can figure out why it happened, but it doesn't help you predict the future. This is the domain of problems like uh, Google advertising, uh, day trading, uh, things like uh, recommendation engines. Should I loan you money? Uh, what's the next book you should read? These are kind of fuzzy problems. And it turns out this sort of organization does not work well solving complex problems. Yet it turns out complex problems are the ones that make a lot of money these days. We've pretty much done our payroll systems. The complicated stuff's been done and done again and again. But when you move over to complex problems, that type of organization does not work very well. And so that's why we're having some strange things happening. So uh, one of the things Dave Snow would also say is most of the times, you don't know what type of problem you're solving. You have to sort of watch how it behaves to see if it behaves in the sort of ways associated with these, these classifications. And he says about 85% of problems are of this nature. He also says you tend to have a prejudice about where you like to solve problems. If you're Donald Trump, everything is simple. You're like me, and I'll fix it. Uh, yeah, I'll raise taxes, we'll fix it. We'll lower taxes, we'll fix it. You know, we'll do something else like that. Uh, of course, it's not a simple problem he's trying to solve. He's a really complex problem. Um, I tend to have a prejudice myself. I tend to like complex problems because I kind of like the, the disorder associated with that, sort of the, the very cowboy sort of nature of that, being an American, of course. Uh, so I tend to make, like, like to work in that segment. But it turns out that segment makes a lot of money these days. So we're solving different type of problems. And so a lot of the traditional ways of thinking about things uh, don't necessarily work. 
So how fast can you go in this world? How fast can you go? So uh, I'm looking at a couple of things. Again, you know, being old, you tend to reminisce about things. So I drew some charts sort of reminiscing about stuff. Uh, that's a log scale on the side here. It talks about how long an iteration lasts. In the original Agile processes, there were quite a few processes back in the original times. Extreme programming from Kent Beck was one of the fastest. It was about a three week iterate, two or three week iteration cycle. Scrum was sitting around two or three months for their cycle. And for that time, that was extremely fast. But you know, as we started playing with this stuff, you know, the, the uh, two or three week cycle of extreme programming got shorter and shorter. To some degree, we, I've discovered that if you have a three week iteration, the first week the programmers kind of rest, the second week they kind of work, and the third week they panic. It turns out panicking is really productive. And so we kind of cut our iterations down to a week. <laughs> but we didn't stop there. All of a sudden, when I was working with some companies here in London, all of a sudden, it almost got down to a day long iteration, that our scope. And then even then, it got even crazy and faster than that. So we're not sitting where we were. If you're still doing two week iterations, you can go a lot faster than that. Uh, and that's happening as well. Uh, another historic chart, this is project delivery cycles. How long does it take to get code out the door? Uh, and I'm going to start with 1980 in this case, another 10 years back, or 20 years back. Again, a log scale at the top. Uh, this is me working at IBM. So, you know, I worked on a project at IBM in this time frame. It took three years. We had 1,000 programmers working on it. We delivered on time. It was exactly the schedule it was supposed to be. And you don't feel too bad for me because we made $1 billion with that software. It was a very, very productive project. But as I kept working at IBM, we got a little bit faster. I got to the point where I was probably delivering every you know, eight months or so. Even when the introduction of object-oriented programming into IBM didn't really speed that up much. But again, this is a log chart, so any straight line here is really a hockey stick. So this is pretty good. We're getting some progress here. Uh, Agile, I'll start playing with Agile. Again, we're shipping in three or four month cycles. So again, a nice improvement, but nothing spectacular. And then the bottom fell out. We basically got into some aggressive agile practices, and we got down to this. This is a hockey stick on a hockey stick chart. This is brutally fast. So how fast did we get? Well, working a few years ago, we got to the point where we we're pushing something new in production every three and a half minutes. If you think you're going fast, you can go faster. So what keeps you from doing three and a half minutes? There are really a set of inhibitors associated with this. And I want to talk about some technology inhibitors, some process inhibitors, and we'll wrap it up with some organizational inhibitors and how we tend to address these in some various clients I've worked with. So first of all is there's Valley Tech. This is a term that is certainly used by the CEOs in uh, the US. And it refers to the concept of what is these Silicon Valley companies doing that we're not doing? Why can't we be like them? And to some degree, it's because they're using technology that a lot of the larger companies are afraid to touch, whether it's using the cloud, uh, using new programming languages, using open source projects. Oh, we can't do that because we're not sure about it. It sounds kind of scary. But if you're not doing this, your competitors are doing it, and they're going to kill you because this makes them go fast. So first of all, it's, you know, from an organization, are you using the right technologies? Are you afraid of these technologies, or are you trying to figure out how to embrace them? The other technology is hardware lead times. How long does it take to get your hardware to do something? And again, I want to go back and draw a nice historic chart. Uh, again, log scale on the side. We'll start in 1990. So basically, if you need to get some hardware in this time frame, um, in 1990, it probably took you about three to six months to get hardware. You had to go figure out what you needed. You had to go order it. Uh, you had to get it installed, get it all working. And that's a bit of a lie, because generally, you had to allocate the capital expense for it the year before. So it would be somewhere between 12 and 18 months to get some new hardware in. That didn't allow you a lot of flexibility. Nice thing is, along came virtual machines. So I could take this hardware now and carve it up differently on my, based upon my needs. And it gave me some new flexibility. And then it got really crazy, because then Amazon comes along. And now I can go get computing power when I need it. It's gone from basically being a capital equipment problem to becoming an operational expense. And you think, that's crazy. A docker comes along, and now I can get stuff in like five seconds. Now, what does this do? If you don't take advantage of this, uh, again, you're missing an opportunity. Because what this winds up doing is basically kills the whole concept of capacity planning. If you're doing capacity planning, you're sitting back in the 1990s think. You're not thinking like today. 
because it's not a capacity issue anymore. If you need the processing power and it can make you money, go buy it. Don't be an idiot. The other thing is these ops guys, uh, they're kind of out of a job. Uh, in fact, the DevOps guys get together and have DevOps conferences, and mostly it's ops guys talking to each other saying, oh, I have a job. Do you still have a job? Oh, yeah, I still have a job. We must still be important. <laughs> they're not. We've outsourced all that stuff to very aggressive tools with some very, very smart companies doing this stuff. So yeah, if you're still doing capacity planning and having these capital expensive plan, you're wasting your time. And if it constrains you from doing the right thing when you need to do it because you're afraid to use the cloud, your competition will kill you. So another technology inhibitor that you need to take advantage of. Now based upon this, we now have our microservices world. It's a direct impact of that curve. So it used to be when I was writing code a lot, you know, I call this a Rails and Java zone. Again, this is a log, log chart, so this is crazy charts. So one big application, it'll be 100,000, a million lines of code, or 10 million lines of code. And then maybe in about 2004, 2005, service-oriented architectures come out. Uh, I remember Credit Suisse at this time was very aggressive in this space. And they took their million lines or multiple millions of lines of code and carved it into like 50,000 or 100,000 line pieces. And that began the SOA stuff. So they had some very large pieces <laughs> uh, like that. But with the advent of the cloud and computing and the advent especially of Docker, you wind up with a whole new world called microservices. And in this space, there's lots of these very, very small services running very aggressively. So, you know, I used to work on a project in India many years ago like that. Uh, I will never do that again. It's just not worth your life to do that sort of stuff. I teach a class. We do, we do a workshop where we build microservices in this space. We, there are about 50 lines of code. We do about 15 or 20 of them in the workshop. Um, this is Forward, the company up in the Camden, New, uh, Camden uh, that I worked with for four or five years. Uh, they, they split off U-Switch as part of that. And basically, we had like you know, around 300 services. None were much more than 100 lines of code. This is Netflix, your online Netflix. This is where they're sitting. Mostly uh, about 600 services, they run about one or 2,000 lines of code in Java. All of this is a result of the previous curve. You can do this because you're taking advantage of the fact computing power can be at your excess when you need it at very aggressive time frames. So this is where the world is going. This is where microservices are. And by the way, this is why all these companies came up at the same time and started doing microservices. These companies in parallel recognize the previous curves. The other thing this allows you to do with microservices is you now build an incremental application. You don't have to build the big thing and turn it on. You can sort of build a little bit at a time, build a little more functionality. Um, this is an example I use in a lot of my presentations talking about putting advertising on a, a web page. And basically we build ourselves a little application that does that. We have a, something that says I need some advertising. I've got a couple of guys down here, services that respond and give you some ads. It's up and running. We're starting to make money. But I can incrementally add things to this application. I can add information about the membership in my frequent renter program. I can do customer segmentation, add additional information. Now it's a smart application. Now it makes even more money. The ROI on this is very aggressive because I get something out so quickly and so early, and I'm trying ideas out aggressively. And this is competitive, gives me a competitive advantage. So databases. Uh, it turns out databases are the thing that's going to hold you back from aggressive microservice deployments. Um, the holy grail has always been, I want an operational database and I want a reporting database. We have two of them because we, we organize them differently. The operational database is pretty much dead. I went to a client, I was talking to one of our hotel clients and I go into his chief architect and I say to him, he says, how many databases do you have? No, I'm a troublemaker. So I knew kind of what his answer was going to be. He says, we have three right now, we're trying to get down to two. I say that's really interesting because you really need 300. Now he thinks I'm crazy, uh, and by the way, that's the last conversation we ever had. <laughs> Which was perfectly okay because after my meeting he was going to tell his new vendor about his new waterfall process. So I didn't want to talk to him either. <laughs> so what's going on is, if you, again what's happening in a lot of the Silicon Valley companies, they've killed the operational SQL database. They're replacing it with an event bus. So the event bus becomes the, the sort of operational database of, of sorts. It's a, it's a persistent store itself. And each of these little services has a database of its own if it needs one. And yes, I'll have all sorts of redundant data. I don't have perfect consistency, 
But for solving complex problems according to that model, this is an excellent architecture. It gives you a competitive advantage. So we use lots of different databases. So just because this service over here has to have transactions doesn't mean all the rest of us are stuck with using SQL Server or Oracle. We can choose the appropriate database for our needs. A little key value store is all we need. I don't need this big Oracle instance in my situation. So it turns out that's a key change, is to rethink how you're using the database. Chad Fowler, who's the, you now sort of the CTO slash CEO of Six Wonderkinder, the company that just got bought by Microsoft last year, first thing he did was his application was tear the database apart. And then build a set of services around that information. That's how he migrated from one of those ugly Rails things into a system that you know, made it so attractive that they paid a billion dollars for his company. So how does this look? Well, you know, this little service up here I talked about basically is sitting there publishing an event on the bus saying I need some advertising. It's collecting the answers. It puts them in its own little Redis database. And then at some point, the science is going to respond back to the customer and give him an answer. So I'll be running four little pieces of code in four different Docker containers. And this little service has its own little database very much like all these others do. This is the new architecture. The event bus is really your persistent store, and these little databases cache information for you. So a whole new architecture associated with this. The other thing is the open source community is, is live and active and provides some extremely great software. Uh, Netflix, of course, is open source almost all their software stack, over 40 open source projects. Very large companies in the US, including the US Department of Defense, are using this stack to build the next generation applications. It's that powerful. Um, you also have things like Docker. If you aren't part of the container world, uh, listen to the container world. It's amazing, uh, amazing how fast these things work. And it's uh, taking over the storm. Almost all of the uh, major vendors now have signed up for this container architectures. It's even become a native architecture now soon on the Mac and the, and the Windows machines where you can run native Docker containers on these platforms. So again, open source stuff. Don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. And finally, there's some disruptive languages. The functional programming languages, the new family of languages, actually not that new. Uh, Lisp is one of the oldest languages ever. Um, but some new languages are being used to do interesting things. If you look at some of the really reliable key pieces of software, Kafka is an event bus used by LinkedIn. It's not written in Java or C++ for performance reasons. It's written in Scala, a functional programming language on the JVM. RabbitMQ, one of the most reliable pieces of little software you'll ever run across, used to be written in a different language. It was buggy as hell. Now it's written in Erlang, a really old language, but a very strange language. They don't use Java and C++ for these things. <coughs> In our experience uh, here in London, I work for the, the Mail Online. Uh, Clifton Cunningham will come up later and talk about some of our experiences there. Uh, we basically had 130,000 lines of Java just to render the pages of the Daily Mail. Replace that with 4,000 lines of closure. These languages are silver bullets. If you're not using them, your competitors are, and they're way faster than you are. So don't be afraid of some of this technology. All right, that's kind of the easy stuff, actually. That's just technology stuff. You can sort of get your head around that because we're kind of geeks at heart. But let's talk about some of the other things, the process problems. Because the processes are also inhibitors. First process issue you've got to wrestle with is what type of problem are you trying to solve? Because if, you're using, if you have experts, and that's your world, architects, designers, you know, business guys who understand the business in imminent detail, and they're driving your organization, and you wind up having to solve a complex problem, it will not work. There are no experts in a complex problem. There are people who think they're experts, they're lying. There's also no role in this for the managers, because part of the manager role is to make sure people are doing what they're supposed to do. You don't know what they're supposed to do. It's a very frustrating job for a manager to sit into a complex problem. They don't understand what's going on. If you try to take your existing organization and solve these problems, it will be extremely frustrating. You will have massive failures. So understand what type of problem you're solving. If it's one of these, yeah, you're, you're, if you're one of these, yes, traditional structures we use, the sort of the classical Indian off offshore model works extremely well for complicated problems. But if you're in the complex domain, don't try it. The other thing is you gotta re revisit how we build things and what we figure out how to build. To some degree, our requirements have always been concepts of stone tablets. Um, to some degree, 
Uh, frankly, this is my fault, or at least my generation. Back in my original programming days, back in the 70s when I was writing code, I'd sit down with a customer, we'd write some code. But it wasn't a lot of code, so it's it easy to do by one. It turns out when we got larger and larger, these problems got larger and larger, we needed a team to work on them. And we finally began to tell the customer, tell me what you want and go away, please. But do want to sign it in blood. You know, sign in blood what you want, we'll go away, we'll get it, trust me. And so we pushed the customer away. It turns out that's a really bad idea for complex problems. Because again, you don't know what the answer is. And for complex problems, we want to move from the stone tablet version of the world into how fast can we try out a new idea? How fast can we try out ideas? You basically want to get into this process of trying things out very aggressively. Because there is no expert. It's only like ideas. Maybe this will work. Let's try it today. Maybe we'll make some more money. OK, what's another idea? Let's try that one. Competitive advantage is how fast can I go from an idea to trying the idea out and either accepting or rejecting it and trying the another extra idea out. This sort of stuff slows you down. We want to have a whole different relationship with our customer in order to do this. Uh, one of the mantras we used at Forward um, was experimentation drives innovation. This was our watchword and how we thought about ourselves. The concept of experimentation is we're going to try things and they will fail. Expect it. If you don't expect the failure, if you try to make sure the failures never occur, you're not trying to solve a, a, a complex problem. You've got some easier problem to solve. But for complex problems, you will have to experiment, and they will fail. We were very good about this at Forward. We would try ideas out. I would say probably six or seven ideas out of every 10 failed. But the three, we made a lot of money off those three. We had one point where we had 50 employees at that point in time. Probably about a third of those were programmers. We made 50 million pounds that year by being aggressive in how fast we can try ideas out. It works extremely well. All right, you also got to rethink how you're interacting with your customer. Um, a colleague of mine back in ThoughtWorks days, we drew this uh, triangle many years ago. And it basically sort of says, characterizes how you talk about requirements in Agile. You know, most Agile processes have the concept of a story. You take a story and break it down to task. But we have said, OK, there are other higher level things. There's things that you might call a feature. And above a feature, is sort of working over a project. And these projects are associated with some sort of a business initiative at the corporate level. So the nice thing about Agile is it's very traceable. Whatever you're working on, you can tie back to a business initiative. Now, most of your Agile processes say, this is how I interact with my customer. My customer decides the stories are. We measure the stories. We count the stories. We, we estimate the stories. This is our level of estimation. Unfortunately, when I go into Agile shops and look at how they're working, you see a lot of this where, in fact, they're managing the programmers at the task level, which is not very fun if you're a programmer. It's like, what did you do yesterday? Why did it take you so long? It's like, you know, wow, I can't wait to go home. I, mean, I don't want to be here. <laughs> so one of the things we did, we've done is basically we've changed our level of interaction with our customer to raising our level of interaction to the feature level. Customer, tell me what you're trying to accomplish. Tell me some KPIs, and then get out of my way. I'm a programmer. I'm really good at figuring out algorithms. Tell me, what you're, tell me what win means, and I can figure out ways to win, especially with these complex environments. So we've changed our interaction model with how we interact with our customers. And the customer role now is to sit with me and generate ideas. And we're going to generate our own ideas as programmers. And we want to keep doing this. And this works, again, extremely well. We don't want to get caught in the story level. That's actually too low for this sort of problem to solve. It slows you down. The other thing we started doing is we started measuring our programmers on different metrics. Uh, I've been a programmer since 1968. I've been measuring about everything you could possibly imagine. Function points, lines of code, uh, call lengths, uh, literally characters I've typed into the keyboard. How many characters do you type in today? And basically, there you are know, all sorts of milestones. And I, believe me, I can game all these metrics. And we do. We game these metrics to make sure we succeed, because that's the metric. We started using a different set of metrics with our programmers. We started giving the business metrics. How much money are we going to make? How many clicks do we get? How many sales did we make? How was our login time, page retention times? These became the metrics we gave to the programmers. And believe me, we started playing these games. We, we could play this game too. Only when we play this game, we all make more money. We were all more successful. And we had a lot of cases where the, the, the customer would come in and say, wow, what did you do yesterday? Because we made we got you know, more logins yesterday. Oh, we tried such and such trick, and it worked. Wow, I never thought of that. That's because we're telling the programmers what the game is. The game is this. Tell us what the real game is. So that's very important to change what we're measuring. And that's sort of the process changes we need to put in place. 
Organization inhibitors. It turns out that the way we organize ourselves almost encourages slow processes and encourages and actually discourages a lot of innovation. And for this, I'm going to talk about the key of this is over-specialization. The, the thing I really wind up seeing, <laughs> hi. <laughs> She's my timekeeper. That may be for me. Uh, we over-specialize. So we tend to actually do, we over-specialize our, our people. And the theory behind over-specialization is a specialist is faster. We want to make sure our specialists are doing the things they're best at. Of course, we, we know now we've underestimated completely the cost of overhead of communication between the specialists, and of course, all the work imbalances that created. And it turns out that completely eats up any of the productivity you gain that way. Basically, the just-in-time stuff and all the stuff from Japan, all the Agile movement has told us that's a really bad idea. All right, so let's do sort of a case study. So it turns out that the titles are, in fact, uh, become the concept of specialization. Specialization is almost encapsulated in your title. And so I, this was a case study. Um, I, I came up to an organization that had about 50 IT professionals. We had about 25 different titles. And we had zero people who knew what we were doing. <laughs> this is what I walked in to see. I mean, literally, the scrum master was trying to understand what was going on at a scrum master level, because nobody else had a picture, because they were all specialists. So that's what we wound up with. And so basically, the idea is, let's fix the titles. we got to fix this problem. The specialists are not working for us. So we fixed the titles. Uh, we took an approach that says, let's define what we care about and the level of competency you sure our people have and the things we care about. So I, I'm a kind of a fan of the three-tier model, Master, Journey, and Apprentice. You can use a four-tier. You can rename it. It doesn't really matter. And then we went through and identified the technologies we liked, the things we thought were important to the business. Uh, Java was on the list. I tried to get Java thrown off the list. Clifton won't let me do that. Um, Clifton explained why he didn't do that later. Um, but yeah, we had a list of key technologies. And we basically had the programmers assess them, assessed relative to their skill level in each one of these key technologies. So we kind of had that mapping. And then we went through and defined new titles. So we killed the concept of Java tech leads and scrum masters and, and all these other titles. We killed all those things in favor of these titles. And you, if you wanted to work on one of the new projects, this is the title you had to assume. Yes, I can't turn around and change your title because it's a contract or whatever, but I don't have to give you the new work. If you want to work on the new stuff, this is your new title. You get to choose. So we called you a developer if you're competent in one of our key technologies. We called you a graduate developer if you're not competent. Now, I put this for Clifton's purpose because Clifton wanted it, but why would I hire somebody who can't do anything? Uh, I'm not sure. We never hired any of those guys, but it's easy to put on the chart. Uh, we called him a senior developer. You're an expert. If you're one of those masters of a technology, whether it's database technologies or perhaps Java, we called you a senior programmer. This is traditional, traditional structure at this point. But then we did something a little weird. We called you a system developer if you're competent in five to seven technologies across the board. Competent, not expert. These are your full stack developers. These are the sort of guys I can give a problem to and they can solve it. I can tell them about a feature and they know how to carve it up between front end, back end, deployment architectures, and the like. And they know their limits. They know where to go grab the experts. We also threw in there a concept of a master developer just to make it interesting. Uh, we would pay the senior developer and the system developer the same amount of money. And if you were a programmer that came to us and says, gee, I want to work on iOS because I don't know it, we say, fine, that would broaden your skills. We will invest in you to learn iOS because we're trying to create more of these system developers. A different mindset. We're not trying to use what you're good at. We're trying to grow your and broaden you to solve real problems. And so we had a parallel tracks there. Now, working for the Daily Mail, the Daily Mail was founded in, uh, I think, 1890, so it's 125 or 26 years old, run by Lord Rothamere, the fourth Lord Rothamere of his title. And so I go to HR in this organization and say, I want to change the titles. What do you think they're going to say? They loved it. Surprise me. I wasn't expecting that. They don't want to be in the business of classifying programmers. That's just nonsense. These forums, and they don't want to be in that world. We're going to do it for them? They love this stuff. So we got an endorsement from a 125-year-old company to do this sort of stuff. And it worked really well. The other thing we did was we fixed the furniture. Uh, this is what Kent Beck said in his first book. You got to make sure people who are working together are sitting together for very good reasons. So we actually ripped out all the desks and put in tables. Uh, this is me doing this in India, by the way. But we did this as well at uh, Daily Mail. 
And finally, we also have the concept that we don't have any dedicated leaders. There's no concept of a leader as a title. The teams will pick their own leaders based on what they need to do. Early on, it's probably your architect running the team, but when you get time to sort of deploy stuff, somebody with more operational experience should be the guy running the team at that point. And we steal this basically from the idea of uh, this, this sort of e uh, book on uh, anthropology, so cultural anthropology, because it, you look at this book and it says, you know, villages never had a dedicated 100% time leader until they got to be 100 people. So you're sitting there with a team of four or five programmers, you got a full-time manager? Really? This is not the world. You don't need that full-time manager. He needs to be doing something else as well. So we go into the concept of, of, of basically leadership being, being a sort of circumstantial, that we bring up the right leader, we, the right leader will emerge as necessary. And that works, has worked really well. And the other thing is we decided you don't want to keep reforming teams around projects because projects kind of don't have any meaning anymore. We don't want to let's say do a big thing and then ship it. We're kind of incrementally doing stuff. So one of the things you want to be careful of is every time you shuffle a team around, it takes a while for them to get productive. So don't keep shuffling your teams around. Bring a new program, bring a new problem to them. They already know how to work together. Keep the teams together. Don't play musical chairs with your programmers. They're not just elements in a spreadsheet to be run around. They don't, aren't, aren't instantly productive. So we put a team together, and then we keep bringing new problems to the team because they know how to solve problems. So that's the difference we do it from an organizational perspective. So if you want to go faster, it's not just microservices. You need to pick a couple of these other things to sort of complement microservices, or otherwise I think you will fail and fail badly. So you probably need to make sure you're going into the cloud, make sure you're using some sort of container architecture, maybe use some sort of managerless process. Because you're solving complex problems, you want to go fast. These roles have no sense. So these are the things you need to do. If you do these correctly, then you wind up with sort of the thing we had observed when we worked in London, and then later on at the Daily Mail, is yeah, we're sitting at a hockey stick, right? This is a hockey stick on a log chart. And you wind up with doing a hockey stick on a hockey stick. You get absolutely insane how fast you can go. This is the benefit of, in fact, fixing some of these other problems and making it work. And that's the story. I have some acknowledgments, but I don't have time for those. And I'm completely out of time, I suspect, presenting.